Listen to the radio. Harry and Edna's wanna show you heard it from the three bells. What ho, Harry? And what ho, Edna? And welcome to Harry and Edna on the wireless as we take you by the hand and guide you through the current UK vintage scene as we broadcast from the Solent whilst facing dear old England. What ho! And welcome to Harry and Edna on the wireless. And in this programme, where we had a hint with our opening track, which was the Spitfire song by Joe Loss, we're going all aeroplane Well, yeah, but not quite Spitfire-y. No, we're going back Slightly even further. further. We're doing true, hardcore vintage. We're joining the 20 Minuters with Lord Flashard. Hoorah! <laughs> yes, we're talking the Royal Flying Corps. Or rather, a, a reenactment group called the Dawn Patrol. But it was an incredible meeting them, um, because obviously it's not a subject that you see covered very often. Well, I, I first and one and only group, I think, that, that do it, I believe. It must be very hard getting a SE5A aeroplane into the back of an Astra. So that means nothing to me. So to our non-aeroplane buffs, that's a... What World would that War One British fighter. Yeah, but even a even Astro a British a fighter, it's a um, it's an old biplane. Yeah, exactly, from so the biplane. First World War. So think biplane from the First World War. Yeah, actually, they didn't have a biplane there, but they did have a propeller. I remember that on display. Yeah, but I'm just trying to conjure the image into our listeners' minds, and it's think biplane, isn't it? It was. Although to be fair, when we interviewed them, this was at the Imperial War Museum in mm. Duxford. And there was plenty of planes there for them to yes, there position was. themselves around. There was. But they had all the kit other than a plane, which was impressive because they, they, they just looked amazing yeah. in all their I'm uniforms. S- I'm so tempted to come out with Lord Flashard lines. I know it was. But I just think when you look at uniforms back then, they were very tailored and very... I mean, obviously they were because they were officers, but it was just such a smart uniform. It was so smart. It had a PhD from Cambridge. Ooh. Listen to you. <laughs> that, that's another Blackadder line. It is, yeah. For those of you who don't know, Blackadder was a TV show in the UK in the 1980s, and it was based on the First World War, and one of the characters in it was Lord Flashard, played by the comedian, the late Rick Mayle. Mayle. Yeah. Mm, he, he did a very good job, didn't he? He did. He, 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 um, he got more, um, what's the word, laughs than mm. the star of the show that was Rowan Atkinson. Yeah, but, but he was a very, it was a very funny role. It was an over-the-top thing. Mm. So how how are we featuring them? We're going to have this group on, aren't we? You did an interview with them, so that's I how did, we're going to yes. feature them. So we're going to play yes. that interview later on in the show. Uh, and we are, then we played Paper Moon, which I do love, mm-hmm. by Dottie Wright. And I was saying, do you know, we are playing tracks I don't think I've heard in, oh, I didn't even know I had half of these. <laughs> but oh. that's the beauty of a massive record collection, isn't it? Is that you... By the time you get to one end of it, you, you kind of discover all the things that you forgot you had. And we have a lot. We do, we do. We still have a huge stack of 78s to get through that we haven't categorised. Because I'm a or bit... listen I'm, to. Well, yeah, I'm a, bit, I'm a bit sad like that. I like to put them in genres. So you've got a vague hope of finding it again. That's right. So what should we play now? Let's play some more tip-top gramophone hmm, tunes. Why don't we play Woody Herman and his orchestra with Laura? What ho! So wake up, dear listener. That was that was music to fall asleep by. Well, we weren't. We were discussing aircraft. We were. I, I know. was explaining the difference between a Spitfire and an SE five A biplane. Well, no, I knew the difference, but when you say SE blah blah blah, that uh, A I zone out and B I have no I I don't link that to a biplane. Well, in yeah. my kind of non non aeroplaney. And I was explaining technical knowledge. Well, we were, I was explaining where we have seen one. Well, actually, we've seen yeah. a reproduction one by our good chum Abs. What are Abs? What are Abs? Who made one for a historical organisation? Yes, that would fit in a car. Actually, and no, it, it didn't. Its in a wings van. fold up, or did they yeah. come off completely? It was designed to fit inside a a regular van. Mm. Literally, a reproduction of this biplane, and it was the most incredible feat of engineering. Yeah. But I just think people are so clever. He's so clever. Do you know what? I think we have an interview with him about that somewhere. Oh, we'll have to dig it out. We'll have to. I'm sure we have somewhere. I of, think we did talk to him about it. We did. Because I remember him saying about how it's much harder to do this reproduction than the real one. Because the real one, once you build it, you don't have to take it apart. But this had to be taken apart every weekend. And moved everywhere across the country. But he did it so that, it, A, you could dismantle it and move it around um, from event to event but also you could sit in it couldn't you because we've got a photo of our children sat in it yeah and I was saying do you know what 
Dear listener, if you listen to Harry Nedden on the wireless, of course, listening on the wireless on the radio is the greatest way at all to listen mm. to. But you can also listen to us on the Listen Again if you go to harrynedna.co.uk. And we, there's always a picture we put up to describe the show. And I said, oh, we'll have to put the one of our children sitting in the biplane. Mm. We have got one somewhere. But I, I just think, because didn't he follow the blueprints of the original? Is that, isn't that how he reconstructed his... Um, reproduction one, but out of you were saying it was out of fiberglass, were you? I no, it, it was wasn't fiberglass. No, 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 no. It was it was it was canvas and wood. wood. But it didn't he have to stretch the canvas? So it's almost it like learning the old technologies. It wasn't quite, well. We'll have to see if we can dig out the interview. Mm. If I can dig it out before the end of the show, we'll, we can play it maybe at the end. Yeah, it was uh, fascinating it fit in. because it was so clever, and I just think some people, a lot of people, are very talented and are able to to just reconstruct something like that well that's his living isn't mm. it he makes things for people and i saw him on the um, national on the bbc we may as well give him a plug mm. the bbc news where he'd built a reproduction um renault 17 tank this is a first world war french tank which the american army used and it was ma- it's one-to-one scale and it looks perfect because i saw well it looked perfect on the telly but it's actually all fiberglass and he made that for an american museum that's when you say Renault, I always think car. It was, I, it's the I same company. It, so I know, it's the I same know, company. but I always... They made tanks, little tanks. Little, little, little tank. <laughs> they did. And, and if you want to know what one of those look like, if you're a Lowell and Hardy fan, mm. there's an episode, they, there's a film they did as, as American soldiers in the First World War. It was filmed, obviously, in the interwar years. And they end up driving one of them with the usually hilarity. I think Stan Lowell's driving it and Oliver Hardy ends up upside down inside it. Oh dear. Do you remember what it's called? No. Oh. Might be Pack Up Your Troubles. That was one of their World War One. I. I didn't realise they did World they, War I. They did two films based mm. on the World War One. I. I just, I just see them. I just think of them as American kind of slapstick humour. Well, it was. It was they very were... slapstick humour. No, humor. I, I didn't realise they recreated periods of history. Yeah, there's one episode where they they um they get separated in the trenches. One I think Stan Lowell gets left behind to guard the trench while the rest go over the top. Mm. And then no, nobody goes back to tell him that the war's over and he's there oh. in the nineteen twenties still marching up and down. Oh bless him. So what happens to the other one? Well, does it tell does it show you? Yes, yeah, so he reads in the newspaper that this guy has been found oh. and he realizes it's his chum, so yeah. he goes back and finds him. And it confuses Mr. Uh, Lowell, because mm. the technology of the day, of the 1930s, is unrecognisable to him. One is which, Lowell of the Hardy is this big American car, mm. and as he drives it into his car, into his garage, mm. there's a little sensor in the in the tarmac, mm. and the garage door opens. Mm. So Did they do that in the 1930s? That's what I say. It's amazing really? the sort of technology he had in the 30s. It's a beautiful Art Deco car he has. And so he lets Stan have a go at it. So Stan has a go, misses the sensor completely and drives clean through the garage. <laughs> but then that's, that's the humour of Laurel and Laurel Hardy. Laurel and Hardy, which is fantastic. I think we should listen to our friends from Dawn mm. Patrol, don't you think? Yeah, should we do it after this track? Yeah, who have we got? It's June Christie. What ho! So Harry and I have come across a group called Dawn Patrol portraying the Royal Flying Corps here at Duxford. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your group and what it is you're portraying? It's uh, early aviators, so it's First World War, obviously, from 1914 to 1918. So the group consists of members of the Royal Flying Corps and also here today we've got uh, members of the Royal Naval Air Service. So as two groups of flyers, in effect, two services, Royal Flying Corps were army-based, Royal Naval Air Service were naval-based, and eventually in 1918 they come together and form what we now know as the RAF. Flying in its infancy, what, what were the aircraft like? Because obviously they're a far cry from what we know and love from the Second World War. Uh, very rudimentary, it was basically canvas, timber, cable, string, you name it, it was just very rudimentary, it was almost... Uh, in the terms of coach building, I guess, rather than aircraft that we know today. There was no steel uh, in the steel, in, like the skin of the aircraft, it's like Spitfires and later aircraft. It was all very much canvas and timber. So uh, flying by the seat of your pants, and I'd say very rudimentary, still very dangerous. Did you have to be of a certain class to fly the aircraft back in those days? Did you have to have a certain qualification? Were you, did you have to be highly educated? What, what was the qualifications? Uh, not at all. Some of the early flyers came from aristocracy and that similar background. They've got fine experience prior to the war. 
But as the war progressed, they were taking on people that had a little degree of uh, knowledge, such as mechanics, uh, a lot of people from the Royal Engineers, because they had a very analytical brain, were often drafted as flyers. But I portray an observer, so I, although I wouldn't have been a flyer, I was actually gazetted or seconded from the Royal Artillery, from my experience of uh, artillery positions. So lots of different backgrounds were pulled in just because of their background experiences. So if you're an observer, are you observing from the air or observing from the ground? Observing from the air. So in effect, I'm, I'm the most important person in the plane. Um, we'd often say that the pilot was our chauffeur. But what we were doing, we were taking enemy positions, any information we can clean from the air, which obviously you've got a fantastic view from there, you can see what's going on. Often if you were in an aircraft, you'd be actually airborne in a balloon taking enemy positions, but obviously you become a, a sitting target, whereas an aircraft, you can move around across a field and you haven't got a great deal of fear of being shot there unless, unless you pose an enemy with aircraft as well. And how long did it take for you to become a qualified pilot, if indeed you needed to be a, a qualified pilot in, in terms of what we understand of that today? You could be airborne uh, perhaps as little as six hours. Needless to say, or whether you, you know or not, but the, the great majority of casualties and deaths were actually in training as opposed to combat. And was that just because literally you, you almost, if you made a mistake, that could be a fatal one? Lack of experience completely. What ho! Can you explain some of the props that you've got here today for display for members of the public? Well, as you can see, we've got uh, two machine guns here. We've got They're both Lewis guns. Both could be mounted onto the aircraft. Uh, some of them would be synchronised to fire through the propeller. Uh, I saw a propeller recently that hadn't been synchronised, so it's riddled with shot. Um, but the most important thing is the flying gear, really. As well as the enemy, the other great enemy was the cold. You're flying at altitude, you're in open cockpits, you haven't got heated suits, so you're wearing a mix of uh, good fitting gear with flying boots, flying coats, flying helmets, fur gloves, a lot of which was used in early motoring. And was that you would be flying in all weathers, in all temperatures? Absolutely, unless it was extremely strong winds. Wind, again, was the enemy for the aircraft of the day. Modern aircraft could cut through strong winds. These couldn't. So generally rain, light winds, it's not a problem. And do you, whilst you're doing your Living History Impression, do you research and read up the articles and the memoirs of men that flew in the day as well? Very much so. And a great thing for us at coming to somewhere like Duxford are hearing other people's experiences. We've been here for the best part of a day now and we've had dozens and dozens of people coming over relating family stories, showing us photographs of great uncles, grandfathers. It's just quite remarkable. How do you get hold of the uniform that you're wearing? Uh, some of the kit's original, but a lot of the uniforms have been made specifically by a military tailor. Uh, she's still lucky enough to have all the original pattern books from the period. So everything that you see here today, from the leatherware, the boots, the uniforms, a lot of it has been made specifically for what we do. Because I guess it is so old now, you wouldn't really want to necessarily wear the kit anymore. Not at all. Uh, certain things like uh, some of the leatherware is quite durable, but any uniforms are really museum preserved really it's not something we'd like to bring out and show at something like this some of our guys actually have and own things but it's it's really for their own personal collections and do you have any recollections or memoirs or stories that you've been told that really stick out in your mind as something that's just stayed with you i, I think perhaps it's more of a family story my my great uncle fought he was in the, on the somme and fought at arras and he was in the machine gun corps this was the very early days of the war and they saw their first aircraft in the field. They'd never seen them before, they'd heard about them. And I know he saw von Richthofen's squadron, known commonly as the, the Red Baron, and his squadron that they referred to as the Flying Circus because they're brightly coloured aircraft, uh, where they took a, a, a Lewis gun that you see here today. And because there wasn't any anti-aircraft gun, they wanted to take fire on these Germans. They pushed a cartwheel into the mud and strapped the gun to it, Hence the very first anti-aircraft gun. Was there a huge pressure on the pilots to, to perform, to go up, to fight, to do their duty? I know a lot of us think of kind of Battle of Britain and that, that 
sort of story and the pressures for the pilots. Did they have their own pressures um, in the First World War? Absolutely. Every time they went up, there was a chance they'd never come back. But I think at the time, there was a great deal of uh, excitement and adventure. Uh, it was an opportunity to fly. A lot of the guys were very, very eager to get up. So I don't think... I don't think it was a great reluctance on the pilots to get up there. They were just keen to get up there and do their thing. What you didn't want to do was let your side down. Absolutely, you went up and did your duty. So where can we see your group and find out more about the work that you do? Well, we travel along to various air shows like Duxford. We occasionally, you can see us at Stowmarie's, which is a great war aerodrome. But at, I don't know whether it may be a, maybe it's a town's commemorative event or similar. But a lot of airfields you'll see us throughout the summer. Well, that's one of those songs that you don't get to hear very often, is it, Harry? Because it's the... Um, well, that was the Cossack War? Band, but yeah. this, yes, it's from the First World War. And the previous song. Pack up your troubles. So, I don't know, are we still vintage or are we going prehistoric? Is that is that dino gramophone? Well, I, we just thought it was very fitting to have these tracks in when you're talking about First World War aircraft because it, it just is very evocative of the time. Um and it's it's just a different style and genre of music. It, it certainly was, because they would have been the pop songs. They were like the musical songs. So you have just listened to the, what do you call it, the 1910s? Is it the 10s? Yeah, yeah. Version of Take That. <laughs> or One Direction. But in those days, you bought, didn't you, the piano. The, you bought the, the music, the, the sheet music. music yeah. That's what I was trying to think of. And then you took it home and you would have learnt the song on the piano. And then... Sung it around the piano, I guess. And the other thing, I don't know, when we, well, li- listening to that interview that we recorded at the Imperial War Museum, thank you very much, Esther Blaine, for Ooh, organising that for thank us. Thank you. Um, was that he was talking about um, a family recollection about the First World War and the first time some of his family members saw aircraft. Mm. And I was thinking, it, A, it's not so long ago, if you think in terms of evolution, we were yeah. flying around like that, and now we're going off to Mars and other places. But also my, my, my grandmother, I mean, I mean, she died probably about 10 years ago now. Mm. But I remember her telling me she remembers the Zeppelins flying over Hull when they and, bombed Hull. And I guess, and I remember your grandma talking about it, I guess if you're not used to anything being in the sky, apart Other from birds, birds yeah. and then seeing this kind of mechanical shape looming over the and horizon. Don't forget, a Zeppelin is huge. Yeah, I exactly. I mean, this isn't small. No, I'm trying to think. It's bigger than a hot air balloon, isn't it? Oh, you know, huge. I'm trying to, trying to put it into you're, perspective. I'm, I'm not, people are Four or five hot air balloons? Uh, no, I reckon you're probably talking sort of jumbo jet size. Mm, I suppose. Because it's a huge... I mean, because you had that big balloon... But they're they're not as narrow, shape, are they? And they're then you huge. had a little bit underneath, which mm. is where the crew were and the bombs were. Yeah. But, the, but the, the actual balloon... It's, if you remember, we used to live very close to Bedford, and there was mm. the Cardington hangars, mm-hmm. and car, they were built for the R101 and the R102 airships. And they were massive. Huge. They were, they absolutely were massive, and they had to huge. be that big to get to get those airships in. So that gives you an idea how huge they must have been. But I'm just massive. thinking, it must have been for your grandma just quite frightening, it's sort of slash exciting, I guess, seeing this what man can put up into into the sky and and it stay up there and suddenly see things flying in the sky. I quite agree. Until they started lobbing bombs out. Well, yeah, but that was a down. That was still very primitive, though, wasn't it? I mean, it was very. Uh, I always think when I think of zeppelins, I always think of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade when they they go up in a airship. This is my film knowledge letting me down. It is, but it's it's it does give you the perspective of how large they are. Mm. Also, mm. proving that we are live, I rummaged very quickly through the Harry and Edna on the wireless library, and I found the interview with Ab Stephen Wilson oh, excellent. talking about the First World War airplanes. Cool. So we shall play that on today's show. Excellent. But first, let's have a little bit of Fletcher Henderson and what ho. There we go. We're back to normal music. Yes, bringing back it back our, up to the uh, usual usual beat. Uh, exactly, to the what the young hip kids of today are listening to. Yeah, so throw that sheet music out the window. Although they're saying that they still did buy sheet music they all throughout, did. didn't they? They certainly did. Now I found that interview with Abs. Mm. It's ten minutes worth of Abs talking about. Uh, sorry, should, shouldn't call him Abs, should we? His real mm. name is Stephen. Hello, Stephen. Isn't he Absalom? Isn't that what, what Abs is short for? Do you know? I honestly can't remember. Because usually Absalom is a name. It's Stephen Abs Wilson. That's all I knew him as. Yeah, I wonder if Abs. And he, everyone called him Abs. Yeah, but Hello, I'm sure his, his name was his, his historical character name was Absalom. 
Maybe. Something that, is that why it's called something. Abs? Yeah. Is anyway. that why I'm called Harold Harry. the Great? Uh, no, Harold <laughs> Dickinson. <laughs> Sir Harold. Not Sir Harold. <laughs> Harold, Harold Stanley Dickinson. <laughs> Anyway, we digress. We are digressing because um, with Abs' interview being so long, we're going to mm. splice it up into, we're going to put some music in between. Um, but we don't really want to cut him out because it was a really interesting yes, chit chat. Yeah. So we're going to play a little bit now of Count Basie and what's the track called? It's called Tickle Toe. What ho? As a special construction for, for English Heritage, myself and my colleagues in my workshop, we're a professional uh, making company, we've been building a full-size First World War fighter aircraft. Um, when I say this to people, they say, well, that sounds huge. It's not huge, but it's a big construction, and it's made so it comes apart, and the public will get a real flavour of what these things were like and how frail they really were when those young men flew in them and diced with death 16,000 feet above the earth. It's, it's a twofold, really. Um, there are real ones. There's a real one where I'm standing at Rest Park, about 10 miles away. And the Shuttleworth Collection have a flyer. Um, Peter Jackson's uh, aviation company uh, in uh, Peter Jackson, the filmmaker who made Lord of the Rings, he has a great interest in World War One aircraft. And in New Zealand, they build these aircraft from scratch. Everything, engines, a lot. And they are absolutely magnificent. We couldn't go to that level. So what I did was go to another company who restore Hawker Hurricanes, who luckily had one of these original aircraft aircraft in pieces and they were incredibly helpful and for a day I just sat with them and said so how does that bit fit to that bit very quickly I learned that to do it the way they did it was a very difficult process and would have cost way beyond the budgets English Heritage could afford so in the end we myself and my colleagues a modern approach in construction using wood and modern composite glues and so on and so forth but we built something which I have to say looks absolutely remarkable it's 27 feet wide and 20 feet long and I've concentrated on all the what I call the fiddly bits so the cockpit and things like that and it really does look like a real one inside what ho their ones weren't made to come apart um, whereas our one has to come to an event in a, in a low loader or a trailer come apart and then be uh, performed and then p- p- taken apart again um, and, and taken away to another store whereas their ones once they were once they were rigged like a ship um, with with tensioned wire they stayed like that but one thing we did have to do was look at the construction of the real ones and very very quickly we realized to use what are called turnbuckles which you get on sort of modern fencing which are like little screw threads that tighten the wire up well they had a much more advanced version of that but as I saw at uh, Hawker Restorations who, who built this fantastic um, Hawker Hurricanes and had the one that we went to look at as they said you won't be able to afford to do it the way they did it so we had to start using flat wood construction we started to look to achieve the effect without using the methods they used because these things were incredibly frail and and without being too rude a lot of modern day public are much heavier than a man wearing flying clothing was in 1917 so essentially we we chose a a structure which we knew could support certainly the weight of people if not actors and reenactors and so forth so we have beefed it up it weighs a lot more than a, a, a you know an original one did what about the materials for it well the real aircraft we're representing an aircraft called an se5a uh, which was designed in uh, 1916 1917 sort of uh, well certainly was flying by 1917 the real one has a, a, a sort of a linen cover now they shrank their linen onto their their structures and we didn't want to go down that route because to be honest it's an incredibly expensive route to take to do it the right way and again we've looked at peter jackson's people in new zealand and the scene the way they did it so very quickly we realized that actually if we used an upholstery grade staple which won't rust then we could staple that into the ash construction of the wings and use a quite heavy grade calico and once we worked that out um, amazingly a a, just a a normal available floor varnish an acrylic floor varnish seemed to do the job of cellulose dope one of the most difficult things was getting the colour right because aircraft in 1917 when they left the factory were a particular colour called PC-10 and the government specified what colour they were as soon as PC-10 got out to France and got into the field it went to kind of dirty brown colour so from being a dark goldy green colour it very quickly weathered and I work a lot at the Imperial War Museum and their PC-10 is a kind of brown colour um, so I decided that we were going to do the factory finish so I've looked into squadron the green one 
did it sort of really bring home a sense of um, how frail and vulnerable these pilots were when you had constructed this aircraft? Every day we look at our construction, which is a lot harder than, and heavier than their construction. You marvel at the fact that these young men were issued without parachutes because they were scared that um, the government or the, the, the powers that be were scared these young men might jump out of perfectly serviceable aircraft. Be scared, basically, so they never gave them parachutes. And there's also there's no room to wear a parachute of their style in these aircraft. And you look at them and you think all they have between a German bullet and them is canvas or, or linen between them and an almost certain death. And without a parachute, of course, that it wasn't for nothing that the pilots referred to aircraft they shot at as flamers, because if you're firing incendiary bullets and you hit their fuel tank, they are going to catch fire. And if you're at 16,000 feet, that's a long way to fall while you're on fire without a parachute. And there are some amazing stories of young men. One young man who, from 56 Squadron, dropping some bombs from his aircraft, like a ground attack roll, and one of the bombs went off, it blew his tail off. But not all of it. He managed to fly along. And then he heard a terrible clunk and his entire undercarriage had fallen away. He got the aircraft down. But then for all of these amazing stories of people in incredible survival, there are countless stories of young men who just fail to come back. And they're all 20, 22 years old. And you look at these things and think, how on earth did they ever have the nerve to go up in them? And I hope our construction will give people a flavour of that. What ho? And it's time for us to fly. So it's a toodle pip from me. And it's a what-o chocks away from me. What-ho!